and we can talk about RVs. I mean, for sure, it's it's um, it's something that I think that I, I would say to people: if you're just starting out, don't don't do yeah, not don't get do an it. RV. Do absolutely not get an RV. Everybody ignores me on that, but it, why? Oh, the, the best thing to do is to the simplest thing, the most convenient thing, and depending on how you run out the numbers, probably the cheapest thing when you're starting is to just go jump in a hotel because you can in and out. You don't have to do, you know, you don't have to roll up the hoses and unplug the things and do, you know, move it around and dump the tanks or whatever at a hotel. You just Get propane and propane's out. Yeah. It's resource management, right? Yeah. So it's depending on the, the amount number of amenities that you have with the, where you're parked. Um, and also your first of deployments are going to be relatively short unless you really knock it out of the park. And then right. if you're on a, if you're on a cat set seven months, if you're on a hurricane seven months after you were deployed and your brand's making new, then yeah, go buy an RV because yeah. you, you absolutely have the money for it yep. and they like what you're doing. So they're going to hang on to you. And you're going to get more work and you're going to you're going to get more work. You're going to be busy. I know guys th that I know that like that happens to them. They're working and working and working and working. And they're like, begging to be to, to take a break right so the sec second thing i always say to everybody is if you're gonna do it and you're not gonna be full-time in it um get a little travel trailer um and get it and get a very very used one yeah. small because what's it, what's the point of it it's shelter right and a place for you to sleep place for you to cook a few meals on a, on a little one burner or two burner yeah. stove and right claims and that's all you're gonna be doing in it right? right you're not gonna be having dance parties and you know the grandkids aren't gonna be there it's a work tool let's talk about gear man talk gear about running, gear running we can we'll talk we about talk about gears or cogs we will restart starting now let's talk about gear james let's talk about <laughs> gear <laughs> this is one of the best parts of the job if you ask me I like gear. Gadgets, gear, vehicles, vehicle setup, um, tool belts, apps, you know, technology things, drones, mm -hmm. all that stuff. What 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 of that stuff is really necessary? You know, what's the best way to set up our vehicle? Let's talk about that stuff. So let's start with the vehicle. Like we're doing, you know. So for for auto claims like how would you do you have to have like a vehicle set up or what do you what do you guys carry no so on day to day on your average auto claim if all you're doing is auto the only thing you're really going to carry with you is you're going to carry um a measuring device um either what's called a dent stick mm -hmm. or a what's called a pocket rod um it's like a retractable which one do you prefer well i know that uh there's this one guy that does this mentor school. He likes the dent stick, but yeah. I prefer the pocket rod because I could just stick it in my pocket, you know. And you know, we carry some some depth tread tools in our phone or camera. Um, I carry a step stool in case there's an SUV. I have to look at the roof. Um, I have that in the vehicle. Um, and then we have this reflective. We have reflector boards uh -huh. which is like a design that will reflect a design with helps dents pop out that you can't see just take pictures with a lot of people use that just for hail but i will use it whenever the the lighting isn't good enough to see the dent at an angle i'll, I'll go ahead and throw the reflector board up so you can see the ripple in the in the uh, paint but uh so it's not a lot most of what you're going to carry for an auto claim you can fit in the trunk of any car okay um you are going to do all of your everything's going to be done on a, a laptop um some companies when you're just doing appraisals um they have apps that are well enough that are set up well enough where you take the photos with the apps you label the photos within the within the app you can close the entire claim within the app others you're gonna to have to go to a website and do it um as a matter of fact there's only two companies i work with that actually that actually have a app i mean i can use the app or i can go online there's one that has an app that i just bypass it and just right use a browser um but that's pretty bit you know on auto you don't really need a ladder unless you're doing unless you're doing a, you know 
specialty RVs equipment, RVs, construction equipment, you know, um, semi trucks, trailers, that sort of thing. Uh, then you're going to need a ladder, either a step ladder, and sometimes you might even need a an extension ladder. And luckily, you know, I carry a, I do carry one of those, you know, fold up extension like a little giant. Yeah. Um, I carry one of those with me. That way, I can pretty much get on anything. Either I can use it as a step ladder, or I can use it as a as an extension ladder, so I can pretty much look at anything. And um, and then you have if you're smart, you're going to carry a, a small cooler of beverages, yep. you know, of water, yep. so you can stay hydrated no matter what type of, time of year it is. A lot of people will forget to drink water even in the winter. Yeah. So, yeah. But uh, that's pretty much it for, or if I'm just running for, for auto, um, and then we can go to a completely different thing for, for right. property, of course. But that's all you really need. That's all you have. And so I, I actually had a ram mount in my truck. You know, yeah. for my for my laptop, so I can just spin it over and do everything right there in the vehicle. Um, unfortunately, and of course, I recently sold, completely changed everything up recently, and uh, and now I'm driving a driving a the Sub the the Subaru Outback, and uh, and I don't have that completely set up the way I want to yet. Yeah, I'm waiting for a couple of items to arrive um, here pretty soon. So you do you think the that that kind of like a crossover vehicle is a is a good choice for like a a dedicated auto? I like it. Rig? The reason why I went with it is because a couple of reasons, and and part of it has to do with well, we'll go into different about the RV and the truck and everything else. But I go a lot of places. I end up going to a lot of places where sometimes they're they're. Dirt roads, country roads, mud, everything else. Right. Unfortunately, the truck I had was pretty much a city truck. You know, it didn't have a locking rear differential. It wasn't four by four. It was just a truck truck, you know. And um, Big hat, no cattle. Pretty much is what it was. <laughs> and uh, it was great. I mean, pulled my RV just fine. You know, no issues with there, but it just really wasn't made for going anywhere other than pavement. Right. And, um, you know, if it were a four by four, they called a mall crawler. You know, right. it's just good for looks. But uh, I've gotten actually stuck in that truck a couple of times. So either I needed to upgrade to a four-wheel drive truck to keep from getting stuck, or I needed an all-wheel drive vehicle. Yep. And due to my knee problem, okay, and I do have arthritis in my hip as well, um, long periods of time in the truck were uncomfortable. So therefore, that's why I went to the wagon. Right. Um, wagons, I think it's perfect for somebody doing dailies. Again, you're going to have the traction you need when you get in adverse conditions, like, you know, mud, things like that, snow, whatever. I am traveling across the country quite a bit this mm -hmm. past year. I expect that's probably going to continue in my future. Um, it's going to be, it's going to be more economical for me to travel in and it's going to be more comfortable for me to travel in as well than the truck was. Are you interested in more than just punching a clock and paying the bills? Wouldn't you rather be on the A-team surrounded by the best of the best in the industry? Then you need to check out Eberl Claim Service. For well over 30 years, Eberl's philosophy of treating adjusters as they wish to be treated has allowed them to establish a vast network of the most professional, educated, and dedicated adjusters in the industry. So at Eberl, you're in good company. If you're a motivated and compassionate adjuster slash claims professional, Eberl wants you to represent their organization. Go to jobs.eberls.com right now and get started with Eberl Claim Service. So that's the reason why, and it's going to hold everything I need. It's going to, it's both rear seats fold down if I need more room and I've got the built-in rack on the top. I can use, utilize that with a, however I need to. So it, it, I think it's going to, did my research, yeah. you know, and I, I'm pretty sure that's the, the perfect vehicle for what I'm using it for. Even during the summer times when I was out running around in the Midwest, storm comes up and these country roads you end up on sometimes. And sometimes just pulling onto some guy's farm, okay? Yeah, right, pulling his yard. He, he's got ruts all the way from the road up to his house, you know, and it's on an incline. And my truck is spinning up the hill trying to get to it. So right. I needed, you know, I think this will be the better choice for what I need it for. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. A lot of guys have uh, pickup trucks on the property side and which I think is a good vehicle for running claims. But the problem is, is that you have to do a little bit of modification to it in order for it to work. I think to work well, and primarily that's putting in a ladder rack yep. so that you can carry extension ladders. You can throw ladders in the bed, 
beats up the bed, scratches yeah. it. Also, pe- people can reach in and grab them. Right. Yeah. So it's not, unless you've got a truck camper or a camper shell. Which is what I had on my previous truck. Yeah. Then, then you know, you can lock that off and, and keep yourself relatively secure. I've, I've used the, the Forerunner for 15 out of the 20 years I ran claims. And it was perfect. I mean, it's right. actually perfect. The, the the luggage rack on top was strong enough to be able to carry a 24 and a 32 yep. um, without rattling, moving around or anything. Um, and then on the inside, it's all inside, right? It's locking, closing doors of the vehicle so I can carry all my stuff in there, you know, my bins in the back and everything. And, you know, it's, it's relatively secure. Um, but that being said... I did have pickup trucks before that that I ran claims in and, and didn't have any problems. I mean, I set them up with ladder racks and everything, um, but they were dualies, and I was pulling a fifth wheel. I was living full time in an RV back then right. too, so it was. I, that's why I had those trucks. And then when I got rid of the fifth wheel, then I got rid of the pickup trucks. Um, so vehicles. I think you know people ask. If they need to get a new truck, or if they need to buy an SUV, I don't think or, it's necessary. I don't think so either, and I, I because I think you can. There, there are ladders that you can get started with, you know, telescoping ladders, it's like a, a sixteen or eighteen foot little giant, and it'll fit in most, right. you know, trunks unless you've got like a super tiny little car, um, and you can. I know there was a lot of guys that I know that would buy like a ten or twelve year old like a GMC Jimmy or something like that right. and put a, a trailer hitch on it that had a ladder holder for their right. folding ladder. And they'd buy They'd buy that whole thing, that whole setup for like 3,500 bucks or less probably and drive it till the wheels fell off of it. Right. And that was their storm truck. And then when they went home, then they would drive their nice fancy pants, GMC, right. you know, pickup truck, um, and not put tens of thousands of miles on it. Um, which is one of the drawbacks to using your personal vehicle miles to do that. Cause even though you get to deduct them off your taxes, bless you. It also wears the car out, right? right. I have 504,000 miles on my forerunner right now what? that I put on it. <laughs> um, and this is in December of 2020. So by the time this goes out, probably going to have five, 10, maybe five, 12. There you go. We'll see. Um, but it runs like a champ, but you know, you keep up with the maintenance on it and that's, an, you know, that's it, a big thing. It's, man, a, it's, it's a really big thing. So when you, when you buy a vehicle, whether you buy one, a new one and you just, just choose, you're going to drive it into the ground or you buy a used one, you have to absolutely. It's a tool. It's a tool. You got to want to make sure that everything on it works great. Right. So it's, I, I recommend buying a used vehicle and taking that sucker in and saying take it to the dealer even and people don't some people don't like to take things to the dealer because they think they're gonna get ripped off they might um i've had experiences both ways with dealers um tell me what you know every, everything is wrong with this thing whatever wherever it's at in the maintenance schedule fix all those things and if the guy comes back with a 3500 hundred dollar bill for right. replacing the radiator replacing timing the chain or belt or doing this or doing that just do it just do it right even right. if it doesn't need probably doesn't need to be done it probably will need to be done especially if it's a higher mileage vehicle then it's done right and then you can you can just kind of start with the baseline you know that that <clears throat> the vehicle is ready to go with all the things that could break down surprise you on cat if your car breaks down when you're on storm then you're dead in the water it's like when your laptop right. breaks down it's the same deal it's an even bigger deal when your car breaks down because that's how you get around to do stuff right you can't you know, you can get an Uber these days, but a lot of places there, Uber isn't there, right? It's, right. And it's a lot of rural places. So vehicle is, is a extremely important part of this whole thing. It's a big expense, right? You can deduct the mileage off your taxes, generally speaking. Again, we're not CPA, so don't listen to us on this. Right. Well, you um, know, actually, if you buy a, one of the things about buying a vehicle, as long as it's new to you, it doesn't have to be brand new, as long as it's new to you. Um, you can take a large part of the depreciation of that vehicle in the first year that you own it. Mm-hmm. Okay, and depending on the gross vehicle weight, depends on how much you can actually deduct from it. But basically, I'm not going to get into specifics, but you can actually, you know, um, write off a very hefty amount yeah. of the purchase price of the vehicle, up to twenty four thousand dollars is what you can write off the purchase price of a vehicle that's 
over a certain gross vehicle weight. Uh-huh. I'm not going to go into specifics and all that stuff. Right, but I, do right. know, I do know the number is 24,000 because that's when I was out looking for a new vehicle. That was my threshold. I was looking for a vehicle to make sure that I got to at least X amount of gross vehicle weight. You ever feel like you've been thrown to the wolves by the IA firms you work for, like you're just a number on a roster? Wouldn't it be nice to work with a firm who's big enough to get plenty of work, but still small enough to know you by your first name? Then let me tell you about my friends at the Oklahoma-based IA firm, Paysetter Claim Service. Founded in 1997, the thing that sets Paysetter apart is their relentless pursuit of excellence. They hold themselves and their team of adjusters to a higher standard of quality. And now with their advanced all-in-one claims platform called Evo, you'll get a real-time Uber-style map and communication link to the insured, automatic messages sent to customers throughout the process, file review automation, and a fast, accurate scope with Paysetter's partnership with Hover. Hover is integrated directly into Evo, making for a smooth and seamless field scoping experience for you as the adjuster. Technology is moving faster than ever, and Paysetter is right there at the cutting edge. AdjusterTV.com slash Paysetter. Yeah, yeah. You know. Talk to the CPA. They'll know all the rules, all that stuff. Yeah. Um, Still can do it for a vehicle that's under that, but you don't get to write off as much. Right, right. So, you know, so when you set up your vehicle, like for on the property side, I generally want to have the ladders outside. I've run with run with a long time with folding ladders and throwing them in the back of my SUV or throwing them in the back of the pickup truck. And it always scratches stuff up and dings things and breaks off plastic pieces and knobs and whatever. Because you, you get out there in the field and toward, especially towards the end of the day when you're tired and you're just like shoving that sucker in there. Right something things start breaking it starts to it's wear and tear on the vehicle right right? you'll find that any piece of equipment whether it's a laptop ladders vehicles phones you know measuring tapes all that stuff will wear out a lot faster with heavy field use for sure so you have to be prepared for that right and it's it is an expense and it's a part of how you need to manage your money when you're talking about doing claims um but you know I've done it a bunch of different ways. The way I think that works best for me, and even this is somebody that writes them up in the field on site, is if I have enough room in the back seat, I'll take a laptop stand and set it up behind the driver's seat or behind the, the passenger seat and work back there. But generally speaking, I'm gonna jump into the truck, turn the AC on, turn the stereo on, and take my laptop and put one put put it on my knee and the, the gear selector mm-hmm. and write it up. And I think I've got like some lower back problems from doing that, being turned a little bit to the right thousands of times, yep. right? So probably not the best thing. You need to have like good posture when you're doing like a lot of work like that sitting at a desk. And, and insurance companies, and cor- companies in general spend a lot of money on ergonomics for people so that their people aren't having to have an arthritis and tendonitis and whatever because they're sitting in a cubicle. Same deal when you're working in your vehicle. All right. Set it up in such a way that you're you're going to be able to sit comfortably forward, right, without be, being tweaked one way or the other, and so that you can write and type and see and have enough light and comfort and whatever. I bought a what I'm waiting to come in right now is a it's a goes on your seat back like for the front seat mm-hmm. fits on the back of that and it's got a desk because you put the laptop on it uh-huh. so you just move the seat forward get in the back seat you yeah. got a desk right there everything you need. So I yeah. can set up the printer to the left side and sit back behind the behind the uh, passenger seat with it forward and kind of lean it back a little bit. And I can sit there and work in the back seat, write up my claims. Yeah. And when I'm done, I can print it, and go around the other side, jump in the driver's side, and skedaddle. Away we go. Yep. So what about other kinds of equipment? Like, let's just kind of hit on ladders for a second. What kind of ladder are you, when you're doing property claims, when you were doing property claims, what were you using? So I had a I had two different ones. I had a 21 foot extension ladder, 21 or 24 foot. It was real light. It wasn't that wasn't that long. And uh, no, wait a minute. I think it was 17 foot. It was a short one. And then I had a 27 footer. Um, and then after I had my little dismount accident, I sold the big ladder because I'm not going to move that thing around. And now I'm doing. The property claims I do now, I'm doing. I, I haven't had a problem just using a using a. I forgot. It's a little giant. I forgot how big it was. A twenty foot, twenty one foot. They have like an eighteen and a twenty two and a. It was twenty two. Something like that. It's a twenty two. Twenty four. That's what it is. 
Yeah. And stuff like that. And so. Uh, and it weighs 10,000 pounds probably. But it's got the little wheels on it. Yeah. You Which, know? you know, makes perfect sense with wheels on the base of a ladder. I'm just saying. It's because you have to drag it, you know, across the right. pavement. Up the, but I had one of those. So, and I actually have another. So I've ended up with three of these. The other two are like a little giant, but they're not. Right. Little giant like brand. A like one's a Werner, and I forgot what the other one is. I got it at Menards up in Marshalltown, Iowa. Um, Take big money at Menards. Exactly. Um, that one is a little bit, I think that was 14. Yeah, that's right. That was a 14 footer. Um, the Werner is a 17 footer, is what that is. And as a matter of fact, um, that was the one I ended up taking with me to Southern Louisiana, and it worked just fine. You know, yeah. um, the little giant was over in storage, and I forgot to grab it whenever I took off with my RV to go down there. I thought it was in the RV. Of course. Yeah. yeah. So I thought I had it. So I used the bunks for storage, and I thought it was back over there. So, yeah. And it wasn't there. But anyway, um, those are what I've been using, and they work great. You know, I, I haven't had any problems. Um, you know, I was. I do know that uh, the bigger the ladder you have, the longer you'll stay on a storm usually. Um, yeah. Uh, and I get that. But uh, I guess I'm not into that anymore. <laughs> no, I guess not. So, and, and the reason why, if you have a, uh, like a 32 foot ladder, if, if you have a two story access ladder, is that not everybody carries that and you may be right. a valuable person. You could loan it to people, certainly, or you could just meet people out on their claims and, right. you know. So that, and you know, the thing about the, the wagon I have now is that, you know, it does have a built-in roof rack on it. And so if I need to take an extension ladder with me or even take my fold-up ladders and flatten them out and put them up there so I have the room in the back, mm -hmm. I can do that. I have that option. Is that a hatchback to, or is it like a door? It's a hatchback is what it is. And uh, even if you get it like one of those rooftop carriers, um, if, even if I just bought one of those, mm -hmm. the ladder will fit inside of it. It'll actually fit inside. I've already checked all that out. Really? Yeah. So if I so like one of those wide like cargo shell. Uh, yeah, it's like the the Thule cargo box. the Thule cargo box. Yeah. You know, um, things six and a half foot long on the inside. Yeah. You know, and that's for my Werner. My Werner would still seventeen foot Werner would still fit inside that. Huh. And so uh, along with my other gear can all go inside that. Right. And I've right. got all my stuff inside the cap. Still got all my space and everything inside the. Uh, inside the vehicle all the space i have in there that way huh. i have all my work junk just right. flying around all over the place and it'll still look okay so uh you know, i this process of buying this vehicle was long it wasn't like i think i'm gonna wake up and just go buy a super outback right you know and i did a lot of research on how i could adapt it for for what i'm using it for yeah and so that's what we ended up with and, and i think it's like i said i think it's gonna work pretty good we're gonna find out that yeah, pretty it's soon. a nice little car. I mean, it's it's it's. Uh, I love the technology in cars these days. I can't wait myself. This is just me. I can't wait for fully self-driving vehicles to be like the, the thing. Like Let me tell you what, man, my Subaru almost drives itself. It's got that eyesight in it, that center. It, it'll center it in the lane, uh -huh. and it has the adaptive cruise control. And so I can take my hands off the steering wheel and eat a sandwich while I'm driving. And it keeps it between the lanes. If somebody gets in front of me or I come up on somebody, it automatically slows down. They move. It accelerates back up. Yep. If traffic comes to a complete stop, it slows down, comes to a complete stop. Traffic takes off. It takes off. It keeps going. Yep, yep. And I never touch the pedals. It's amazing. Amazing. It's just amazing. I'm like, and it's not a self-driving car. I understand that. And, you know, I'm, I'm not endorsing people to drive their Subarus like I am. Right. They actually tell you not to. But you can, <laughs> and it's fun, and, yeah. uh, and I'm, I'm enjoying the heck out of it. So yeah, we rented a a, a new Rav Four. Um, oh, was it pretty nice? Yeah, and it had the adaptive cruise control. I don't think it. I don't know if it had the. We only had it for a day because we were. My truck was in the shop, so we rented that anyway. Um, and it had the adaptive radar cruise control thing on, it, and I set it at 65 miles an hour going down this two lane little country road out back here got behind a guy driving a truck with pulling a horse trailer and i you could set it for how many car lengths you yep. want to be behind yep. and he started to slow down and put his left turn signal on and there was other cars coming and i was like he's gonna have to stop to make that turn and i was like Dee marie was in the car and i was like i'm not gonna touch the pedals and see what happens and she's like don't you dare do that 
didn't touch the pedals. We, you know, he stopped, and we came to a nice stop. Yep. And sat there, and I'm like, I'm not touching anything. I mean, I got hands on the steering wheel. And finally, he goes, and like, kind of, he's turning, making a slow turn, and we start to pick up, t- start to go and pick up speed and up to 65 miles an hour. Yeah. I was like, it's, it's awesome. This is, we have to have this. We have to. Have it's this. awesome, man. I'm enjoying it. So, so as um, other equipment, mm-hmm. um, so on, on property, of course, you know, we have all our little gadgets. We have a lot of gadgets. That's Lots for sure. of gadget moisture meters. Yep, yep. Not every but not every carrier wants you to use a moisture meter. Um, some do. Some are like absolutely not because not everybody knows how to use them. Yep. Um, but we have to have ways to collect data, yep. right? Which is what we do. So and one of the biggest things that we do is measure things. Yep. I have measuring. All types of measuring devices. I have laser measuring devices. Yep. I have LIDAR measuring devices now. I yeah, picked one yeah. up. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Yeah, that's nice. Stand at the ground, and I can measure the peak on the house. It's freaking great. Really? Oh, yeah. So is it like something you plug into your phone? or No, it's um, it's the, um, I forgot what brand that is. I mean, it, and it syncs up with, it syncs up with uh, Xactimate. Was yeah. Hold on a second. This, yeah. this is yeah. news flash. Of course, dude. They had it. At, they had it at Elevate. You, you. We played around with it. The AR rim thing. Yeah. Well, no. It's weird. I mean, it's it's just like a laser measuring device, but it's got lidar on it, and you can look at the screen and you can point out on the screen. Oh. So it's not even. A, you know, and so you sit there and make all your measurements, and boom, it pops all your dimensions in for you, and it transfers it over to Xactimate. They had it at Elevate. Yeah. Why don't I remember that? I'm standing like one end of the room, and I measured the other end of the room and the wall and everything else, and it put put it all in there. What did the, what did the gadget look like? It's the what is the name of that? Um, it's the popular brand that everybody uses. It's oh the Leica. Yeah, I like what's that. Oh uh, okay. Yeah. So it's a laser measure. It wasn't a lidar. No, it's lidar, dude. Huh. So. Wow. Yes, big things are coming, guys. Honestly, the the thing is, is that we sit here and talk about like a laser measure and measuring tape and hover.to and Matterport and this and that, right? The fact of the matter is, is that we're going to be at a point at which something like Xactimate Mobile is going to have LiDAR built into it because the, the new iPad Pros, I think, have LiDAR in them, right? Right. So if you just stand in the middle of the room and just do a circle and you get the room dimensioned, completely and that just goes straight into your diagram then i'm going to pull out my tape measure and double check measurements but that's that's cutting down the the time of scoping considerably if it works which you know why wouldn't it work i mean they were showing us um the laser sketching like app thing where you point it around the room and you can get the measurements of the room using ar right back in 2012 that's eight years ago nine years ago right so i think we've come a long way with this stuff it's interesting it's a little bit exciting um a a lot of the technology can go into the insured's hands Mm -hmm. you know which unfortunately or fortunately depending on on how you want to look at it i think that uh you know we talk about this but insureds are probably going to get more of this little small tiny claims that we used to get and then we're going to be getting the bigger ones which it's all right with me, right? Um, disto, that's what I'm trying to think. The disto, yeah. And it's and, I'm, and my bad, it's not really LiDAR. It's, oh, man. It, I was like, but what? It's, but it's, uh, it's the X4. Yeah, it's got the little the video screen on it. Right. That's what you're talking that's about. That's what I meant. I'm sorry, I don't know why I said You LiDAR. meant video, old video, timer. Yeah, you know, me and technology. Yeah. So, yeah, so we have a lot of, a lot of little gadgets that we carry around. I mean, for the auto guys, we have more stuff than the auto guys, I think, just because there's more things for us to, to do, to look at, right? All right. So we have some required things that a lot of companies require. Like, some, like we said, some companies are going to require a moisture meter. I think everybody requires a, a pitch gauge so you get yep. the, the pitch of the roof because that, that will tell you. It has an effect on the price of the replacement on a roof. Got to uh, carry your chalk. Got chalk. Cases of chalk. Shingle gauge. Um, a uh, putty knife. 
putty knife. I carry around some of those airplane snips, those yeah. like tin snips. I got those. So you can snip off siding for ITEL. Um, cameras. My camera is actually on the shelf a right razor, now. Razor, uh, a box cutter. Yep, yep. Utility knife, box cutter for cutting out uh, flooring samples. Mainly carpet. You're not really going to use that on like flooring, flooring. Unless you're really good at Unless it. You're, and usually what you do in that case, like if you've got like solid wood flooring or you've got some engineered flooring or something like that, or something that you can't tear or cut yourself, the water mitigation person probably did it. They already for took you. care of it. Yep. Yeah. So it may be sitting there. They may have sent it off to ITEL already, you know, depending on. It just depends, right? So, and it depends on if you were able to talk to that person before you came out, right? Um, we want to have, we've got safety stuff, you know, uh, rope and harness. We've got cougar paws, which cougar paws are like 150 bucks for the pair. And get some, you always want to have extra pads for the mm -hmm. shoes because when those wear down to where they're flush with that plastic edge yeah, on them. You're done. You know, another thing to take into consideration is, is kind of how you dress, right? So for summertime stuff, obviously your, your khakis and golf shirts. Um, you can wear light colored long sleeve shirts with, you know, not with mm -hmm. the sleeves rolled up so that you kind of protect your skin and it, they can, it can keep you cooler um, and keep you from getting a sunburn. Or a hat, you know, yep. with a big rim on it. Use sunscreen. So see my sombrero that I carry. Yeah, get a sombrero. In the wintertime, if you're doing cold weather claims, layer up, right? It's yep. not so critical that you're wearing a company golf shirt because nobody's going to see it. But, you know, you should, most most carriers are going to have, you know, cold weather apparel. They, they may have, you know, beanies or whatever. Right. And then, like, a, you know, winter coat that has you know, insurance company name, whatever on it. Um, I take some like pack boots. Cause sometimes if you, if you get called on like a, like a way to snowstorm in, you know, Buffalo, New York, or up in someplace where they get a lot of like deep snow and you're having to trudge around somebody's yard in two and a half feet of snow, you're going to want some snow pants and some pack boots, right? So that you can get around to the backside of the house to take pictures of the tree. That's, I don't even know what those are. Just super heavy, Texas. insulated, like waterproof <laughs> boots, right? That lace. You, I mean, they're like mucklucks. I'll just put on my my fishing waders. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> so, and you can wear waders, right? It's just don't wear this. Don't put your wear spikes in the house. I have. I will tell you that I have climbed roofs in the winter, and you don't need to do that. There's not. A, there's no compelling reason that I can think of to try to access a roof when it's got snow and ice on it yeah. there just isn't right even if it's to like reassure the insured i'm going to say listen i'm not we can't climb on your roof it's just with if it's got snow and any snow and ice on it at all i'm not getting on it because usually the snow and ice is down by the edge anyway so that's where you're getting on off the ladder which is already the, the least safe part of you know accessing a roof and i said i don't know why in the past i've done it to get try to get pictures like if a tree limb falls and lands on the roof you want to get pictures of damage to shingles so that you can, sometimes it, it has to open up. You have to show damage to the outside mm -hmm. of the roof that, that created an opening by the stuff that put a hole in the, in the shingles or whatever in order to cover, to, to op trigger coverage for the inside. Right. So you want to get a picture of that so that you can, but you can haul your ladder around and set it up on the side of the house and crawl up and look. And if that doesn't work, then take it around to the other side and right. do your best to get a good photo. And if you can see it, you're part of the data collection, right? So if you can't get a good picture of it, try to get it, the best picture you can, but you can also be like, listen, you know, I couldn't access the roof, but I was able to see the pictures are fuzzy. I couldn't get a good picture, but I was able to see that there's a hole in the roof, right? I instructed the insured to put a tarp on it, whatever, right? Um, be safe. Even though you think that landing in snow from 12 feet up is going to be fun, it's not. It's not going to be fun because who knows what's under the snow anyway, right? Exactly. Fence pole, post or, you know. Um, Aunt Edna. And what? Aunt Edna. Aunt, 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 Aunt Edna also Aunt. could be there as well. Yeah. That's for vacation. Oh. Never mind. <laughs> she was under the snow? No, she wasn't under the snow. She was, she just, was on the roof? Oh, that was up, Grandma. She, yeah, that was Aunt Edna who was on the roof of the uh, station wagon. I just threw that out there randomly, man. You can edit that out if you need to. We're good. <laughs> no problem. No problem. 
You know, facing a lawsuit can be a terrifying and stressful experience, jeopardizing your years of hard work and success. If you don't have adequate insurance coverage as an adjuster, you're putting yourself at great financial risk. If you make your living from handling claims as an independent adjuster, then you must get errors and emissions and general liability insurance coverage. It doesn't matter if you're a 1099 or a W-2 or you work carrier direct, Protect yourself with professional liability insurance from Kaplik. To find out more and to download the insurance for adjusters free guide, head on over to cplic.net slash adjuster TV. That's cplic.net slash adjuster TV. So what else can we say about gear? You know, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a huge part of what we do. Um, I think, you see people with all different kinds of setups. I found the lightest, the light and fast setup. It works best for me. Um, if I have tape measure, if I'm doing all exterior, if it's all hail claims, I'm not carrying a laser with me. I've got my camera yeah. and my tape measure and then I'll have like, maybe I get like, yeah, a, do we like, have your hand? Will you have your hundred footer with you? No, I don't use a hundred foot tape. Okay. I haven't. I mean, I have. I you have measure the, You got to measure the fence. Yeah. Just count posts. Yeah. I measure off between two posts. Usually it's eight feet. Sometimes yeah. it's 10 feet. And then I stand there and I count posts down the thing. What if you had a drunk fence maker that wasn't accurate? I'm going to be off. Okay. My QA will QA me on it. So okay. I carry, and then I'll carry like, like a mag dump pouch or something like that where that has my chalk, my pitch gauge and my shingle gauge in it. And maybe like a flashlight or something. Okay. And even then, I don't really need the flashlight because I'm using my phone these days. No, I carry it. a flashlight. And that's it, usually. Yeah, I make sure I have it because I have to go up in the attic and look at yeah. the underside of the decking or, you know, trying to figure out where it leak came from. I'll just yeah, or if they have wood shake, you, you absolutely want to get a picture of that decking, space decking underneath because that's... It was incredible how many, how many houses I looked at that after a storm and said they had a water leak. And I went, and you looked up there, and you see all this mold and deteriorated decking, and it's been going on forever. Yeah. And now all of a sudden, oh, we got a leak in the roof. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, hey, you've had a leak in that roof for quite some time. You know, sorry. <laughs> Listen, I'll tell you, if they had a leak, this is, and this is something that I, I, I want to say to everybody. Your, your job is to give the benefit of the doubt to the insured. Houses leak, right, right. all over the place. If you, if, you, if you go into somebody's house and you see water spot on the ceiling and there's not like six concentric rings which clearly show it, it leaked in, made a stain, and it stopped. And it leaked in some more a different time, a bigger stain, yep. right? If you see one, it looks like it happened one time, but you see stains on the, the, the framing and stuff like that up in the attic, You'll see that in a lot of attics, right? Even if they didn't have any leak at all, I'm still paying for that inside damage. I'm right. not going to say, "Well, it looks like it leaked in before," because the damage only happened the one time. Yeah, and we paid for the inside yeah. damage. We yeah. just told them, "Hey, the rest of that up there, you're going to have to." But just generally speaking, because people will get like, there's there's a lot of confusion out there about, you know, it seems simple, you know, well if it's repeated and continuous, you know. There's some confusion out there as to exactly what repeated and continuous may or may right. not look like, right? If it's got something growing on it, that doesn't mean that it's repeated and continuous. It may, it may mean that the power's off and it's 105 degrees with 98% humidity, and in 72 hours, stuff's going to start growing, right. guaranteed, right? Right. So it's not repeated and continuous, right? So you're paying for that, even if it's got some black stuff growing on it or whatever, fur, right. buzz, you know, hurricane claims down on the coast in Florida. Oh, yeah. I mean, condo the windows. The next day, they're going to have... Yeah. So, if the, all the windows are blown out and the power's out and the insured lives in New York and isn't the first time anybody's coming into that property is two weeks after the hurricane blew through, there's two inches of black fuzz on everything, right? We're talking about, you know, November and and now they're saying they have a water leak and you go up there and you see that, yeah. you know, in the the past week the highest temperature has been 50 degrees yeah you know so it's what are you gonna do so um i'm gonna give them the benefit of the doubt okay. i'm actually not gonna go into the attic and look at anything on if i see a water spot on the ceiling 
That's why. Well, I, I had to determine where it was coming from. Oh. And that's where I found it. It was around a pipe jack. Yeah. That's where it came from. And that's where everything was at. Um, other gear, in addition to... Um, we're going to kind of segue into the conversation about... I got, I've had a conversation last night with somebody about RVs. Okay. You know, and RV is a tool. I mean, it, it's just like anything else. It's something you're going to use for business. Yep. I had a pickup truck. I had an RV. I lived in that thing for three months last year when I first got started. Um, or you're whatever we're at now, year before last. Um, you know, um, it was a great little RV. Pulled it, my truck pulled it just perfect, you know, no issues. But then when it came time for storm season, I had seven deployments. And out of seven, I used it twice. Yeah, yeah. You know, and the reason being is is, is that uh, either I had to get to where I was going too quickly, I didn't have enough time to go get the RV and travel with it, the extra time it takes along with getting it set up and being ready to go, didn't have time. You know, and the other problem was RV became extremely popular and there's certain certain states you go to that everybody owns an RV and they camp on the weekends. Yeah. And could not find a place. Absolutely could not find a place to, to park my, my trailer. Because they were all reserved for the Because they were all reserved for the weekends. I could come in on Mondays, but I have to be out on Thursdays. You know? Yeah. But that just didn't work with a travel trailer. Now, when I do it again, you know, motorhome. Yeah. Because if I do have to pull out, I can just pull around the corner, park. You know, right. if that's what I have to do, that's what I can do. If that's the route I'm going to go again, that's that's the route I would go as yeah. a motorhome because that's going to be a lot easier. It's going to be a lot simpler and easier and 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 I can move it a lot. People don't understand what it takes in the travel trailer, yeah, you know, yeah. to to set that thing up and take it down and everything else. And I understand motorhomes are you say a lot of work with those as well, but it's a little different. That's the route I would go. Yeah. And I know. I think RV is, and we can talk about RVs. I mean, for sure, it's it's um, it's something that I think that I, I would say to people: if you're just starting out, don't don't do yeah, not don't get do an it. RV. Do absolutely not get an RV. Everybody ignores me on that, but it, why? Oh, the the best thing to do is to the simplest thing, the most convenient thing, and depending on how you run out the numbers, probably the cheapest thing when you're starting is to just go jump in a hotel because you can in and out, you don't have to do, you know, you don't have to roll up the hoses and unplug the things and do, you know, move it around and dump the tanks or whatever at a hotel. You just Get propane and propane's out. Yeah. It's resource management, right? Yeah. So it's depending on the, the amount number of amenities that you have with the, where you're parked. Um, and also your first of deployments are going to be relatively short unless you really knock it out of the park. And then right. if you're on a, if you're on a cat set seven months, if you're on a hurricane seven months after you were deployed and your brand's making new, then yeah, go buy an RV because yep. you absolutely have the money for it yep. and they like what you're doing. So they're going to hang on to you and you're going to get more work and you're going to get, you're going to get more work. You're going to be busy. I know guys th that I know that like that happens to them. They're working and working and working and working. And they're like, begging to be to, to take a break right so the sec second thing i always say to everybody is if you're gonna do it and you're not gonna be full-time in it um get a little travel trailer um and get it and get a very very used one yeah. small because what's the, what's the point of it it's shelter right and a place for you to sleep place for you to cook a few meals on a, on a little one burner or two burner yeah. stove and right claims and that's all you're gonna be doing in it right, right. you're not gonna be having dance parties and you know the grandkids aren't gonna be there it's a work tool it does you can take it on vacations or whatever but if you wanted to like have something for the kids and everything that's then it becomes something that you use for both those right. things if you're just gonna get an rv just to make storms easier i would say go with a travel trailer that being said <laughs> if you want to really go all in and be a, pro a property adjuster who does cat and and or who offers themselves up to to go do daily remotely like yeah. there are places in the country that where they're they always need adjusters always always any time of the year right right 
and it's hard to get find good people in those places a or b it's you know hard to get anybody in those places right um we'll take the northwest for as an example northeast and the northwest underserved by our community if you call alacrity or eberl or pilot or crawford or sedgwick or whoever and say hey listen you know we're, we're full-time in an rv and we wanted to see if you guys had any need for a daily adjuster anywhere in the country we'll travel we'll, you know we'll go up to the northwest if, you, if you've got a, a, a client carrier client up there that you know like liberty mutuals big huge mm-hmm. up there safeco um i've done that for them right and they're like yeah if you're going to be there we'll give you claims right they're not cat claims they're right. daily claims they're their water, their properties, fire claims, their vandalism claims, their regular old claims, right? You can do that and you can work the whole year. Right. Absolutely. Right. If you're, if you're willing to cut, cut the dock lines and cast off and be fully on the Mobile. road, yep. motorhome is going to be the, I think it's going to be the way to go for a number of reasons. These days, there are a growing number of remote work opportunities for independent adjusters. With scoper writer programs popping up all over the place, you can do photo and scope in the field, or you can just sit at home in your pajajays and write the estimates on what the scoper got when they were out in the field. And it doesn't matter where you live, as long as you have the internet, you can write claims as a desk adjuster. But you can't get that sweet gig without being licensed. So if you live in Nebraska, which doesn't require an adjuster to be licensed, you still have to have a New York license to write claims somebody scoped in New York. Makes sense? Of all the credentials you need as an adjuster, there really is none more important than your adjuster license, especially your first one. You're gonna need it to do just about everything else, including some adjuster schools even require you to have one before they'll let you enroll. So you need Adjuster Pro. Adjuster Pro provides a comprehensive and easy to use way to get and maintain your adjuster licenses. Most importantly, Adjuster Pro was founded by independent adjusters and the team at Adjuster Pro is dedicated to helping you thrive as an adjuster with resources for every licensing state, including dead simple CE packages. Adjuster Pro is the gold standard for adjuster licensing. You'll find everything you need to get licensed in one place. Go to adjustertv.com slash adjuster pro right now. Primarily because when you, if you do a lot of traveling from point A to point B to point C, then you are, especially if you're traveling long distances, like multi-day trips, I have done it in a, in a fifth wheel and I've done it in a motor home and it is th- the comfort level is infinity better in the motor home because in the motor home, especially we don't have slides on our motor home, which I think I don't. It's personal preference, but it makes it easier for us. Um, when you're driving down the highway, my wife can flop out on the couch and watch TV, right? She can cook dinner. She can go to the bathroom. She can go back to bed. She can sew. She can play the guitar and sing. She can do whatever she wants to. And if there aren't slides, right? Where if you've been in a motorhome that has right. slides, there's a little narrow space in between the, where the two slides come in, mm-hmm. and there's just no room to do anything, right? And it's dark in there, and it's just, it's it's like you're, I don't know, if with no slides, it becomes like it's just your house, and you're all, it's always the same no matter where. If you're on the driving down the road, or you pull in the Walmart to park overnight, there's you don't have to do anything. You just stop, turn it off, and then turn on the TV, turn on the generator and turn on the TV, right? That's right. all you got to do. You don't have to jack around with slides and, and, you know, setting furniture back up and doing all this. Like you, you have to remodel the place every time you stop. You go to the bathroom while you're going down the highway, right? Not the driver. Obviously. Yeah, I was say, I want to say that one. <laughs> so, right. So I love that. I had that. a Jeep. I just cut a hole in the floor. <laughs> the motorhome that we have has three huge bays underneath mm-hmm. that you can store anything under there. Yeah. You could have a, like, you know, 20 people could like crawl under there and put a kayak under there. You could put five kayaks under there. Right? Yeah. You, you could put all kinds of stuff. So if you're, if you're full time, the, the biggest benefit to a motorhome like storage, that is storage, be storage. Stor- the basement storage, especially if you go with a diesel pusher, that's going to have the best storage. Right. Yep. Um, Fifth wheels or have a lot of interior room, 
but terrible storage. Terrible storage. Travel so, trailers, same deal. Well, some some fifth wheels have some pretty decent storage. If, if you get a tra- if you get a toy hauler, you know, like I had a toy hauler, and I, I used the backpack from a motorcycle and for storage, but it also had like an attic storage right. thing too. Well, you know, and and so I had the RV, okay, and of course I've sold the RV since. And when I look at what I did this this past year and since I've gotten started in this. Other than that first few months when I went out to West Texas and worked in West Texas, I cannot say that if you exclude that, if you exclude that, there was absolutely no reason for me to have an RV this past year. Yeah. None. I mean, it it would have been great if I could have taken it on some of the places I went to, but I couldn't because of the availability of spaces. Yeah. And then number two is, or the, just the time factor, I couldn't do it. Then all that, all those months that sat there in Texas while I was in other places, um, I, can't, I don't have a place to park it at my house, so I had to pay for storage. You know, yeah, I yeah. still got to pay insurance on it. Yep, yep. You know, I still got to maintain the thing. It had all those things that I had to deal with. You know, and at the same time, I was finding extended stay hotels for about the same price as I was finding RV parks to stay in because right. RV parks have gone up in price. You know, or they just can't get them. So, um, extended stays. You know, a lot of the I firms have discount codes, and you can get them for really, really cheap. Yes. Um, there's one that uh, I stayed in. I stayed in uh, Extended Stay Americas for thirty nine dollars a night. You know, up in Minneapolis. Yeah. You know, that's just. I mean, you're going to pay thirty five dollars a night for a, you know, at a cheap RV park. You know? Oh yeah. And yeah. up there, you couldn't get it for that cheap. Yeah. in that area so it was better off that it ended up doing that anyway and i went to iowa i found some some scary hotel for 150 bucks a week you know yeah, yeah. <laughs> so that stayed was in some interesting that was places. that was really fun and then but whenever i went to southern louisiana that was great i found an rv park down there but of course like everything else they jacked up the price on it you know but at least it worked out for me that time you know that i had it but then now i know some tricks about you know what to do now when you go to an area like that and how to get places to stay and where to go and that sort of thing and so and that's a total number of topic we'll go in for another day but you know the rv don't as somebody knew unless you're really going to be using all the time and that was the other thing was i was never home long enough to take a vacation right 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 exactly and then you're not really wanting a vacation in an rv in the winter months no, because you're going to want to go to the beach. Yes, it's not as enjoyable. The tropics. Right. So so that was the reason why we sold it. And so my advice to people, based on my experience, when I went through this past year, I never had the opportunity to use it to travel. I mean, right. as much as I traveled this year, as many miles as I did, as many different places I went to, um, I didn't have that many opportunities to use it. Right. Matter of fact, the only t- two times I used it was the both t- was I was in Louisiana twice this past year. And it was both times I was in Louisiana. Yeah. And that was it. Yeah. People say, you know, they think, and they're not quite thinking it through with this. They're like, oh, well, you know, we'll get it and we'll have it for vacationing. You know, in the summertime, we can like pile the kids up and go for two or three weeks and go out to Grand Canyon and Glacier and, right. you know, all this stuff and see the, the West Coast and da da da. They're right in the middle of storm season. You bought this thing for, for chasing storms. Yeah. You're going to be working. If you, if you try to run off for three weeks or two weeks, you're going to miss or one week. You're going to get a call in the middle of that, and that trip's going to get cut short. Like I said, the longest every I was home time. was 10 days. Every other time was five to six days I was home. Been gone again. Every time, yeah. So, but that's all. I, I mean, somebody brought that up, and so I thought we'd address it. Um, yeah, no, it's, you know, a, it's a good and, one. And it's a tool. It's it's, But I think you should, until you get to the point where you're absolutely either full-time in it or you know that you're going to be places for a long period of time, I'd, I would probably refrain from it and, yeah. and shoot for the – and I understand sometimes you're going to have to park far away. Hey, I mean, the closest I could get to Lake Charles, okay, uh, the closest I could get to Lake Charles from when I was in southern Louisiana in an RV was Broussard, Louisiana, the other side of Lafayette. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So luckily my claims were all in Crowley, Louisiana, which was halfway between where I was. So I got lucky on that regard. But uh, Yeah, I had to park in Mobile during Hurricane Katrina. And all my claims were on the west side of Mississippi. So it was two hour, at least a two hour one way commute. Yep. 
scraping love bugs off the front of the truck oh, yeah. every day. Hotter than... So when I was up in Iowa, Marshalltown, Iowa, I met that guy that you used to run with. Oh, Dirk? Dirk, yeah. 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 He was, he was running a couple hours a day to his claims. Yeah. He was having to do that. You know, he was a couple hours out from where he was working. He, they were probably giving him, like, commercial farm ranch stuff. He's been doing this for yeah. the, the exact same amount of time I have. Yeah. So, um, nice guy. Super nice oh, guy. Oh, yeah. So, and then I, just another consideration with the RV, because some people aren't going to listen. I will tell you, as far as the configuration of an RV, like, if you, if you get to the point where you're like, you know what, I think it, it makes sense to get an RV and do this, I'm still going to advocate for a, a little travel trailer. And the reason why is because... If you have a fifth wheel over versus a fifth wheel, right? A fifth wheel, you're going to have a lot of room in it, a lot more room than you're in a travel trailer. That's for sure, depending on the size of the travel trailer. But having run, lived in a fifth wheel for a number of years and tried to run claims as a cat adjuster, the fifth wheel takes up part of the bed of the truck. Yep. And your 32 foot ladder and your 24 foot ladder have to have a place to go. Right. And if you don't have a toy hauler where you can open up the back and has a door that goes in and then you can just slide them in there and strap them down somehow. If you don't have a motorcycle sitting there, you got to find a place to stick your ladders. And if you if I try taking them in through the, the side door, mm -hmm. the big old fiberglass ladder, and it, it's, it hits the other wall before you can turn it and get it in. You can't get it in that just through the right. door if you don't have a way to open up the back. So then I'm um, sitting on the side of the RV climbing up to the top, pulling it up, and trying to strap it down to that little flimsy luggage rack yep. rail that they got up there. They'll probably rip out if you get trucking down fast. the high. And that's what I did. So I had my ladder up on top of that. Right. So the fifth wheel takes up your whole bed. You can't keep stuff back there. Yep. A bin, maybe, and like, a, like a, a lug wrench or something. But that's about it. Right. Yep. Don't try to like think that you're going to bring a bunch of stuff with you with the, with the fifth wheel because your bed's going to be taken up with it. The last RV claim I did... Um, last week the guy owned a company that he traveled quite a bit and he had his his super duty set up with welder beds on it and utility beds mm -hmm. but because they had to carry all their tools and their welders and everything else in the back of it they used to have fifth wheels but then they couldn't take all the equipment they needed so they sold their fifth wheels and now they have bumper pulls yeah you know because yeah. they couldn't take their equipment couldn't take their ladders with them couldn't take their gear with them right exactly and everything else so now they've got bumper pulls and so and just for people who don't know a travel trailer is an RV that is you tow from the bumper of the vehicle, right? right. It's like an right. Airstream is a travel trailer. And a fifth wheel is something that has the, the, it goes over the back of the pickup truck and has the hitch in the middle of the bed of the pickup truck. Correct. It's, it's a little bit more stable on the highway. It's a bigger, you can, you can haul more with it because you can. It's easier to back up. It's easier to, they're easier to back up. Backing trailers is not any fun anyway, but. Um, That's because you don't know how. Oh no, I know how. I like to race in reverse with a trailer. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, so that's my that's my one thing I'm going to say. If you're if you're going to go go in on an RV and you already have a, a house and a mortgage and you're not going to go full time on the road, get a travel trailer. Get a, a an SUV that has the guts to be able to pull ten thousand pounds, or get yourself a pickup truck with the, with a camper shell or your ladder rack on it, and then running that because then you don't have to take the whole thing apart and try to find places to stick your ladders with the fifth wheel because the fifth wheel is not going to accommodate my them. pickup truck had a had a topper on it with a built-in rack on top of it so i could throw ladders on top of that if i needed to and had the rest of the back of it your fifth wheel no my my pickup truck oh. had an are fiberglass top uh -huh. that had a built-in tule rack Oh yeah, 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 yeah. And so I was able to throw ladders, time. ladders on top of that, and then the rest of my stuff. Yeah. Oh, speaking of things to travel with, I almost forgot about this. Your whoopee? No, a small folding table. Okay. Um, found that to be very important. I actually have one. It's four foot long. It folds in half. The legs extend out on it. Um, when I was in Iowa, the little, the little uh, um, motel hell I was staying in didn't have a desk no place to work and so i happen to have that little table and a folding chair and that's where i worked from yeah you know yeah. that was where i where i worked a lot of my that's where i sat down and made all my phone calls organized all my claims and and uh when i had to work from the if i couldn't finish it up in the field for whatever reason yeah. that's where i was working at was yep. was right there in the room so uh, another really really good gadget that you wouldn't think of is one of those 
collapsing laundry baskets. Yep. A little, you know, that big around. Because yep. you have lawn, socks and underwear and stuff all over. The, you take them, your clothes off to change your clothes and you just leave them on the floor. You put them in a pile behind the, the, the lazy boy that they have in there in the hotel room. Get it with, if they're like $9. So this is what I, how I handle that problem. I get the, uh, the totes from Home Depot, mm-hmm. the black ones with the yeah. yellow lids. That's what I put my clothes in when I'm traveling. Yeah. And so when I get to the hotel room, I put my stuff away. And as I take my dirty clothes off, they go into that bin. Yeah. So when it's time to go to the laundry, that's my laundry basket. Dang, that's pretty That's simple. how I use it. Yeah. And then when it's time to go, you know, I, yeah. if I, either, I either have a full tote of dirty clothes and if it's just not fully dirty, I'll just get a trash bag, throw my dirty clothes in that, you know, throw it in the back of the truck, wash it when I get home. So yeah, yeah. that's how I, I do that. That way I have to worry about the the, the uh, laundry basket. Well, the laundry that's basket, it, it collapses down to about that thick. All right. And you can slide it in anywhere you want to in the vehicle. Gotcha. And a note, I would say, about working in your hotel room or working uh, – in a place like at home, like doing desk, remote desk work or whatever. Something that I've discovered that I found to be a little bit counterintuitive um, at first was that I was a whole lot more productive if I went to the cat office and worked or if I went to Starbucks or a coffee shop and sat there on their internet and worked. Like at the end of the day, if I had a bunch of stuff to do, like I'd make phone calls in the car, check my voicemail in the car, write them all down make all those calls, call everybody back, and then I'd go into Starbucks, get myself, you know, a yeah, green iced tea or Starbucks. whatever, put my headphones on, and just get into updating all those files, do any corrections. If I had one that I couldn't quite close in the field, finish that one, and then when I close my, I upload everything and I close my laptop, go back to the hotel, that bag, my laptop bag stays in the chair or on the, by the bed or by the door or whatever it is. I don't pull it out and then stay up till 11 o'clock jacking with that stuff. I'll sit there. It's, there's a motivation factor for me, a lack of distractions that when I go and I sit at, in the office, I don't want to be there, right? I don't want to be sitting at Starbucks. So, but I want to be done with this and I don't want to be doing it at home or right. at the hotel or at the RV or whatever. I want to be, I want to put my feet up when I get home, have dinner, hang out with my wife, watch Netflix, whatever, right? So I found that if even just having, doing work in my hotel room, even if I'm by myself, it's too many opportunities for distraction for me. I can do it, right? right? But it's, it's easy to, to like, it's easy to, to find other things that will like grab my attention. I guess that's a, just a personal thing for preference yeah. because I can, I find out that if I get to the room, I want to get it done as quickly as possible. Yeah. So I can have distractions, you know, I mean, sure, I, yeah. I just block everything out. This is what I mean. I turn my phone off, you know, get my work done and, uh, as fast as I can. I mean, I even call my wife until my work, my work's done. Yeah. You and know, it's even, you know. it's, it's the other reason why I close claims in the field because I don't want to even sit at Starbucks and do that. I want to yeah. like have the, all the conversations. I don't want to have to make follow up settlement calls with the insureds. I want to have that conversation with them right then. That claim is completely closed. It's done. It's going into my bank account. Right. I'm sending up the invoice, right? It's done. I get back to the hotel room, put my feet up, have a microwave dinner, you know, whatever. So I had this one. Yeah. I was, uh, this was in just outside of Milwaukee one year in summertime. It's beautiful up there, by the way. If you've not been to the northern states during the summer, it is absolutely gorgeous. Um, talking to all you Texans. And so I meet the contractor out there, and this is a neighborhood I hadn't been in yet. And as far as I knew, nobody had been in on this hailstorm. And it's a beautiful bluebird day. Sun's out. It's 10 o'clock in the morning, 10.30 in the morning. The sun's at the perfect angle to be able to look at fascia. This is, but I, when I think about the times of day, I'm like, that's a good fascia looking time of day, right? And meet this guy in the yard, you know, at, at, at the insurance house, and he's 20, you know. I don't know what it is with these young guys, but we'll, we'll, I'll explain why I say that in just a second. But so he's kind of cool, right? But a little bit like, kind of, you can tell he's got a little bit of like bravado. He's a little cocky. He's kind of like, you know, here's my card, you know, puffing his chest out a little bit. Insurance not home. 
right? And I, I met them on several claims. Insured was never home. Um, walk around the house, looking at the, you know, start at the front, work our, ran, work our way around the house, take pictures of no damage, not seeing anything. The storm that, that affected the, the general area was came out of the southeast, and which was perfect because the sun was right over there and it was shining perfectly on the face. And we get around to the, the side of the house where the brunt of the storm came in, looking up at the fascia and there's not spattering. It's, this is like a 10 year old house and it's got a broad, flat fascia without any like, you know, little right. waves or, you know, des- there's no design or pattern to it. It was just perfectly smooth and perfectly dent free. There was not, there was nothing on it, right? And I'm taking pictures of that. And I'm like, I'm like, well, so far I'm not seeing a whole lot, man. I'm, I was like, yeah, I, I like to tease contractors sometimes, you know. I'm like, yeah. I hope when we get up on the roof, maybe there's something up there. And, you know, he goes, he kind of gets a little close to me. And he's like, I mean, come on, dude, you got to admit, I mean, at least some hail hit this. And I'm like, I do not admit that at all. <laughs> you know, I, I, you can, we can both of us look right here and see that there's zero hail. Hail may have hit it, like, but it wasn't big enough to cause any damage, right? If they had hail here, it wasn't big enough to do anything. That's what I said. Get up on the roof, wander around on the roof, looking at stuff. He's making circles here and there, things of, of nothing, right? Usual. And I'm doing my test square, F equals zero, back equals zero. Same deal. I'm like, oh, dude, I'm just not seeing it, man. I mean, well, you know, how can you say there isn't any hail damage, you know, and if we got this house bought and that house bought and this house bought, you know, blah, blah, blah. I don't hear any nail guns. I don't hear any hammers. Yeah. I don't see any roofer signs in anybody's yards in this neighborhood, right? And he's he's like, he gets close to me again, and he's like, he's like, uh, yeah, I guess I get it, I get it, I get it. But, I mean, just between you and me, I mean, you got to admit, you know, there's, there is some hail damage to this roof. I mean, you just, you know, you just can't. You guys are just, you know, you're just not supposed to pay for or some, some whatever i was like no i don't admit that at all that's not that's not true i just i told you what i what i think i think that there's no hail damage on this house yeah well you know okay fine you know whatever you know we'll, we'll talk to the homeowner and we'll you know typical whatever right three or four more inspections with this guy over the course of a week i get a call like at the end of that week from the carrier manager who i was working directly for because it was just a i was like a right. standalone one guy deal on this and she was like hey matt just wanted to uh just just check in with you have you met with uh have you met with the uh, cnc or whatever it was construction yet and i was like oh yeah i had several with those guys this week those guys are kind of weird she's like yeah well listen <clears throat> here's what they're doing <laughs> She said, we're getting a lot of complaints from the insured, from insureds on this, because what they're doing is, is that that, that neighborhood, that you, I know where they're at, I know what neighborhood that is, there's no, we know there's no damage there, but what they're doing is, is that they're trying, they're getting the adjuster to say that they think that there is, but they're not going to pay for it, or they're using that, what are right. getting them to admit that there's at least something there. They're recording the conversation, the guy's got a recorder in his pocket. Right, so they they go down after after you leave, they they go meet with the insured, and they play back. They they leave out the rest of the the conversation, and they play back just the part where you say, "Well, yeah, I mean, I guess there could be." Da 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 da. Once some other adjuster that was in the neighborhood, a staff guy, was like, "Well, I mean, I guess it's possible," said something like that, right. and they got zinged on it. Right. So, and I met with this guy a few more times, and and. Uh, I just didn't say anything at all, nothing. And he he was started acting like he didn't know what to think of that, right? And just those guys, and he would like, I mean, standing like right next to me. Come on, bro. Listen, bro. I'd have had fun with that next time I said, so which pockets do you record me? Well, I, you like know, I, closer. I thought about doing that. <laughs> I thought about doing that, but I was like, discretion is the better part of valor, I think, in this case. Because who knows? I mean, I... It would have made a much better story if I had right. like been like gotten down close to his leg and been like, I don't think there's any damage at all. <laughs> that would have been great. But sadly, I don't have that story to tell. But it's like you, you have to be consistent with what you're saying because those guys, some of them, they will try to get you. Yep. On t- 
And in Wisconsin, I had to look it up. It was like, you know, it's a, it's a one party recording, whatever. You yeah, know. you only have to have one party needs to know that you're being recorded. Yeah. As long as one party knows, that's all that matters. Right. The same jackass thing, same thing is Texas, man. secretly doing it. I mean, it's like, whatever. So I had this one. This is the easiest one ever. Yeah. Got to the house. So I talked to the insured. And she went, oh, yeah, I've got a roofer. And I said, you know, go ahead and make sure they're out there. And she goes, okay, well, here's his phone number. You know, I'll let him know, but here's his phone number in case he calls you. Roofer calls, hey, man, um, what time are you going to be out there? I said, this time. Well, I can't make it. Um, Can you make it another time? Like, no, man, I've already booked for the day. I've already got on my schedule. I've got to make it. All right. Well, let me see if I can get somebody else to meet you out there. Yep. You know, so I get there. There's a truck there from that roofing company. I look up on the roof. There's this, and it's a, it's a fairly steep roof, man. This guy's walking around up there with cowboy boots on. Oh yeah, <laughs> I've seen that guy. He's wearing cowboy boots, and I'm like, "There's no way I'm getting on this roof without cougar paws." Right. Okay. Probably going to break out my, break out my my rope. Right. You know, and this dude's just like running around on there in a pair of areas, you know? Yep. And I said, how do you? He goes, hey, how you doing? I was like, he goes, man, just get back in the truck. There ain't no damage on this thing. <laughs> I was like, well, he goes, I'm sorry we wasted your time. That kid, man, it's, he's, he's going to get us in trouble with you guys. Yep. I'm like going, what? Yeah, yeah. Are you kidding me? He goes, oh, man. He goes, dude, let me buy a, let me buy a Starbucks or Coca-Cola or something for wasting your time coming out of here, man. I just, just, I'm like, Wow, I said, well, I still got to do the inspection. I'm here, you know. Well, Ryan, let me help you. What can I do for you? He goes, I'm up here. Let me take the photos while I'm up here. You know, it, just, it was just like. Yeah, that so, happens. So this guy was the, this guy was like that young kid's boss, yeah. you know. And he just goes, man, he goes, he, he comes downstairs. He rings the doorbell. Well, he says, hey, look, I want to apologize to y'all. You know, there's no damage to your house. I'm sorry he came over and did that to you. Because in the future, should you ever have an issue, would you give us a call? You know, mm-hmm. and let me make it up to you then. A local you guy. Know. Yeah, it's a local guy. You know, and I'm just like going, man, what? It, what happened here, man? <laughs> I'm like, and I'm thinking to myself, if I get back in the game, you know, that's the guy I want to work for. Right. Right. I mean, just honest as could be. You know, and uh, so I don't know if he was the manager or the owner i don't remember what he was but he's like just get back in your truck <laughs> i said no i gotta do it man yeah and so we went around and and looked at it and you know there was some scarring on the fence you know needs to be restained you know that sort of thing right, there's some right. decking and that that sort of stuff and so i had to document all that stuff and everything and the guy's like walking around here let me let me measure this for you you know and he had his ladder i just went up there with his ladder and just marked the roof you know walked around looked at it yeah, nothing. Yeah. It was just metal damage. There was some soft metal damage, but there was no, and some scarring on the fence, but there was nothing on that roof at all. I mean, not, not even the gutters. Gutters weren't even damaged. Yeah. You yeah. know, it uh, it's like, okay, we're good. I love it when that happens. It's not often, but it does happen. He's <laughs> like, yeah, we're going to, I might, I think we're going to have to cut him loose. I'm like, ah, you know, I wouldn't do that to the kid. Just, <laughs> just mentor him a little bit more. I might yeah. need to just Elmer the kid a little bit. And he goes, okay. So, hey. Guess what time it is. Hit me with what you got there, brother. You want to pick the last one I have in my hand? Look at this. You know, I tried to write some jokes about retired people, but none of them worked. I don't get it. (laughs) If you enjoyed this episode of Adjuster TV Radio, leave us a five-star review on iTunes. Find more episodes at adjustertv.com slash podcast. This is Adjuster TV.